Yeah. All righty. So. Are you going to pray first? Yes. <laughs> I will. Thank you, Father, for this wonderful opportunity just to have fellowship with like-minded people and to discuss your word. Father, through your spirit, help us to understand and comprehend your word. And also prepare and prepare us in what you want us to know um, so we can be ready for whatever's coming. And we thank you for helping us, for guiding us, for leading us, and for loving us. I thank you and I ask you for all this. In the mighty name of Yeshua Mashiach. Amen. 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 Alright, so the one I have gone through is called Chukat, which is roughly translated as regulation. Um, I'm going to just jump into one of my other studies just to give a bit of a context on the meaning of this word. So basically this Torah portion, I only look at the word Chukat and I only look at the red defer. That's only two things. And they are very complex ideas, but they are interlinked. Now the word chukat, if you look at the letters, the chuf, the chet, kuf, and taf. Now chet is a doorway. Now spiritual doorways is where you move from one medium to another. Now the temple had three gates or three doorways. We transition from one phase to another. And that basically is a picture of spiritual maturity mm -hmm. or growing into one phase mm -hmm. or another. You can see that the letter taf is also a doorway. And you get the letter hey that's also a doorway so it's actually three letters that are doorways and every doorway has got a different meaning now the meaning for chet is also the letter the eighth letter of the aleph bet and the eighth letter is linked to eternity mm. it's it's also the infinite sign that's where the infinity sign comes from mm. and the infinity sign comes from the concept of the repeating cycle now the reason number eight is associated with infinity or, or eternity is because the number eight number one is the same number in a seven um, time cycle so when you go through what day one to seven the eighth day is also day one and then the cycle repeats mm -hmm. so the eighth day that's also when they circumcise a boy is basically the sign of a new beginning a new cycle happening and the mikvah is also part of the association of that um, dying, standing up into a new phase, and death and life is also associated with that. Now, the letter Taf, just like Chet represents life, Taf represents death. Now we have the two poles that are contradictory to one another, because the one will destroy the other. <clears throat> Either if there's death and someone raises him from a death, death is destroyed and you raise up into life. Or if you're alive and you die, death will replace life. So it's two poles. It's like north and south, black and white, hot and cold, the extremes, the ultimate extremes of something. Mm -hmm. Now within this letter is also the concept of a paradox. Now the letter of the word chukat means ordinances and also decrees. And they say that the decree is something beyond human comprehension. You need wisdom to understand a decree. The other thing about a decree is a decree is something that a king could utter but he could not take it back. And um, the only person who can add to a law is a king or an authority of a, like a king. Um, so you get the normal Torah, um, the ordinances and all of that. And a decree is on top of that or additional to that. And the decree can then be seen just like um, a normal commandment. Or it can also be like a verdict where you can have a decree to set people free, to uh, apply grace. And mercy and basically to reverse the consequence of breaking a commandment so that's the book of Esther where there was a first decree they all will die then she intervened and then the king made a second decree because he couldn't reverse the first one the second decree was give them weapons they can defend themselves and they overcame the first decree so the second decree was adding grace and that's in the hand of the king to decide whether he want to do that there's also um, examples in the New Testament where Yeshua taught parables about the rich young man, not the rich young man, the man <coughs> who owed money he was and he was set free <coughs> by his master and then he got and he forced his neighbor to give him money back that he owed him and oh. then it reversed back on him. So the decree can be applied either way. Mm. So it's in the hand of a king or a judge to utter a decree. 
Now, the reason why Chukat is, is, is important from the concept of a decree, it is associated with judgment as well. And because we're in Devarim, the wilderness, we are um, traveling towards the border of the Promised Land where the Jordan is. That's in the time frame of end times, the time frame where I believe we're currently at. And we are gradually moving closer and closer as we go towards that time of the end. Now, the red heifer in itself, the symbolism of the red heifer is associated with the second coming of Messiah. So there's a few things we're going to look at to confirm that. So the red heifer is also very significant in this time frame, specifically to us. And um, yeah, so that's also interesting. Now, the first thing I want to dwell on is the letters or the paradoxes that exist. But before I go there, I just want to talk about the letter Kuf. And when I did my study on the letter Kuf, I realized that it is like a gateway. It's also a gateway, but it's like a little portal gateway. It's like the concept of the well we looked at last time. So it's not a doorway, it's more like an a entry, like a into a higher dimension kind of thing. Now the word Kodesh is associated with that. And I did that when I did the letter Kuf and the letter Lamet through the words Kol and Kal, which is sound and light. And the Kuf reaches down, as you can see, into the lower, but it gives access to a higher dimension or to where Yahweh is. So that is um, an entry point. Now, looking at the two doorways with the entry point in the middle make this word a very interesting word um, that deals with the physical realm and how it touches the spiritual realm. Now, when you look at science, science is uh, the means to try and explain the physical realm. And then they discovered that Newtonian science is no longer good enough to explain what's out there through so experiments they've done. So I'm just going to quickly dabble on quantum physics because that's the science that actually explains our world a bit better. But it's a science that also dabbles into the spiritual because some of the concepts mm. in quantum physics are spiritual concepts, mm. things that we can't explain. And anything you can't explain is a paradox. Mm. And now one of the, the, the experiments experiments they've done is where they prove that one thing can exist in two places at exactly the mm. same time. Mm. Um, they've done that through DNA or whatever and the spinning of molecules and they removed two particles, I don't know how far apart, and they measured it and then they spin the orientation or the atoms in some one direction and immediately yeah. it's spinning on the other side mm. as well. So they are connected mm. outside of time and there's zero time uh, in, between. in between, so it's an immediate connection. Mm. Um, the other experiment they've done is where they've done an experiment, um, and when the observer observed the experiment, it changed mm. the outcome. Mm. So where the person who's conducting the experiment actually influenced the experiment itself. Mm. So those ideas also exist within the Hebrew language, and mm. within the text, and within the Torah. Because the Hebrew language is an extraterrestrial language that is not from this world. It is coming directly from Yahweh's mind. Mm. It's a spiritual language. And being a spiritual language, it's a multidimensional language. And the spiritual realm is full of paradoxes. I think the whole spiritual realm just consists of paradoxes. Mm. Now, paradox is mm. where one thing exists together with something else and they're totally opposing mm. one another, like life and death. The other examples we have is in, in the Ten Plagues, as well as in the Plagues of Revelation, where hail and fire come down at the same time. Fire can put out water, water can create fire, great fire whatever. So the, <coughs> the two things that cannot exist in the same place, and if they do, it means it's a spiritual concept. And that's the only reason why they can exist like that. So the paradoxes in the Hebrew language, for example, is, is one of the words that come to mind is the word Kodesh. If you change the vowel points to Kadash, it means male temple prostitute. If you, you just read as Kodesh, it means holy. Mm. Wow. So the two are totally opposing to one another mm. in the idea of what it's about, because one is to be holy unto Yahweh, the other one is to be holy as a male temple prostitute. Mm. So it's totally defiling what mm. is holy. But the, the core meaning of Kodesh actually just means to be set apart. Mm. To be set apart to something. Um, so in that way, it's, it's, it's a paradox. Mm. 
Now, where the paradox exists within the text is where the Hebrew language is written without vowel points, mm. just consonants. Mm. So the reader needs to insert the vowel points. So you can imagine if I read the word Koresh and I decide mm. I'm going to put Koresh in there, just change mm. the vowel points, I'm going to melt that prostitute there um, instead of holiness. Mm. So the, the meaning will totally change based on the observer or the reader. So how the reader interact with the text determines what the text will respond with. Mm -hmm. So that means that the word can be good or the word can be evil. The, the word can be uh, beneficial or the word can be destructive mm -hmm. in a sense, depending on the reader. The other idea is that the Torah and the Hebrew language is like a code. Mm -hmm. um, and if you go into all, all the un underlining meanings, it actually gives you different meanings. Um, is that transcends time and culture. So it's a timeless language that can be interpreted by someone in any time frame <coughs> that will mean, mean some, something to someone regardless of their culture or their background mm -hmm. and that can mean something to someone personally mm -hmm. as the reader or the person who interacts with the word mm -hmm. regardless of translation. So. Time and time again, me going through the Torah portion, it's always in sync with something in my life. I'm yeah. currently preparing for the book of Hebrews. So this week I was studying um, Hebraic thought and all that, just to do a preparation and some background into moving into this book and looking at today's Torah portion. It's all about the paradoxes of the Hebrew language and all of those things. That's perfectly in sync mm. to what I'm busy with anyway. Mm. So that just... Um, it's not it's a supernatural coincidence, yeah. mm -hmm. so to speak. Right. So that means the word is alive. Yeah. And even Yahweh decided when I'm gonna start the book of Hebrews and I need to spend maybe two weeks prior to the Torah portion to start my thought train. And at the point where I get my thoughts ready on the Thursday, guess what happens on that Saturday? We've got this Torah portion that just underlines what I'm already mm -hmm. busy with. So it's all in sync and it's all related and it's very personal to me in that mm -hmm. regard. So that proves to me that the word, first of all, is alive. Mm. Yeah. And if I interact with the word, I know that Yahweh is mm. speaking to me. Mm. I just need to allow him to speak and to mm. listen. Mm. And if essentially we have to listen. Of the, um, the original text not having the vowel points. Because yes. you pray for yeah. understanding and the Holy yes. Spirit mm. can, can alter your perception of what you're reading mm. at any given time. You can read the same passage with vowel points. Vowel points, and then they mean completely different things when you read it. If the vowel points are put somewhere else, you know, so it's, it's like an un, it's, it's like the, all the messages are already there in the unvowel pointed text. It's just how you perceive it at the time that you read it. So the vowel points in the in the uh, <clears throat> some of the scrolls that they put in is basically just a translation. Yeah. Mm. It's, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. it's the interpretation of what the vowel point should be at that point in time in their life within their culture within their time frame yeah. within the situation that they had and the text responded to them in that mm. way so now we sort of you know interact with that yeah yeah it's mm. maybe a pickle mm. or not but if you go into the Hebrew yourself and it is possible even though you don't understand Hebrew mm. because we've got the tools and the means mm. in the sense of a dictionary so there's a strong dictionary I've got Davar, that's also a dictionary. Mm. You can dial up the Hebrew number, the Strong's mm. number, you can read the meanings yourself, mm. and then you can place the just one verse there with the different meanings, so you can just meditate on it, mm. and it will speak to you. Mm. And that's how you interact with it. Yeah. Without that's what the lilies mean. Yeah, to consider the lilies. Consider to, the lilies. to meditate wow. on the word. That's, that's what it actually means. Yeah. It's to sit down and just look little, at them. The smallest yeah. little detail, the yeah. macro detail. Yeah. 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 Just let it speak. Oh my goodness, I was looking at a weed earlier today up in the, the thing and just like looking at it because I was, the difference between daily light and fire weed, I don't know what it is, but <laughs> I think I'm looking at fire weed here, but then, I, <laughs> but then I've actually like looked at the, the leaf itself and then the... You went into it a little bit. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> Spent a lot of time looking at plants, you know, in the, the macro, yeah. but then you step back and you see the whole valley like... 
That's what that's what reading the King James is like, just looking at the whole valley because you yeah. don't really know that things are a lot smaller than they seem. That's mm-hmm. right. Mm-hmm. And then you can go into the seed as well mm-hmm. and realize what the seed is. Mm-hmm. And the seed actually holds yes. all, all of it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's what Mum and I were doing when we first got chickens, and it was at the beginning of coronavirus. <laughs> and we set them free in the little pen, and they're just happily pecking away, and like, Look at them, they don't care that the world is in chaos. No, they don't yeah, care. They <laughs> they've got feathers, they've got food, they perch at night and they're fine. Mm-hmm. But I think care. you're going to touch on that anyway, about animals, plants and Yeah, us. yeah, yeah, which is oh, a very today. interesting oh, thought. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. Um, so one of the verses that I used in this study is a verse that actually says exactly that. It says in Psalm 62.11, one thing Elohim has spoken, two things I have heard. Power belongs to you, Elohim. Mm. So one thing he has spoken, two things I have heard. So that means that one word mm. can mean more than one thing mm. yeah. ah, to one person. Mm. So that means that mm. a translation is a personal thing. Mm. Um, it doesn't matter which translation you read from which Bible. But what you need to understand it, it is someone's interpretation of the mm. text. It is not accurate. Yeah. It's not 100%. Mm. It's not personal. Mm. And there's some translations where they built in their doctrines yeah. because the person mm. got their belief system and they need to sometimes force the verse mm. to make it read what they so believe what they can so that they won't, mm. you know, so they, their wheels don't mm. come off. Now, Mike Heiser is starting a series that he advertised on Facebook, was it? Yeah, Facebook. We just did a little introduction based on that That's gonna happen um, soon. premise. Oh. So he's going to go through, I think, the whole of the Bible in six yes. months. Who um, is that? Mike Heiser? Oh, okay. So he's a Christian, yeah. but he's a Hebrew scholar and a Greek scholar. He's, mm. he's uh, many ancient languages. Language. Ancient mm. languages. Started ancient languages. Ancient languages. Started watching them mm. this, this week. Yeah. Yeah, so, for the benefit of our Christian brothers, I think Yahweh is using him to start laying foundation mm-hmm. in that regard. Not only the, to trust blindly what the translation says, yeah. but... The series is called, your, be- your Bible needs to make sense. Yeah. Okay. It needs to make okay. sense. And so, I'm definitely going to... Do you know this what? verse in Psalms, just this week I've been... I was meditating on that because it, it always puzzled me why it says one thing, because... Michael like King James says no two. I said, uh, and I'm thinking, well, was he wrong the first time? Well, it can't mean that. And then just the first time, think, oh, one thing is spoken, but two things I've heard. Because mm-hmm. yeah, that means mm-hmm. that's it's a good yeah. example of that translation. Yeah. Making it um, yeah, narrowing something it. Yeah. by adding yeah. one English mm-hmm. word yeah, in to like make no, it mean well, something. One thing yeah. is it, no two, or, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So what I've done, I've done my own little translation. <laughs> of course. <laughs> when you take the Hebrew from the dictionary, you take out all the this and the ants and the whatever. You just take the raw words as they are. And basically what it says is um, one word Elohim, two which here, and strength leader. If you just take the words as they are, directly from the Hebrew text. Mm-hmm. Without any... Read it again. Um, one word Elohim, two which year, and strength leader. Wow. So that doesn't make sense at all. Oh. So if, if you just read the Hebrew consonants without vowel points and without the prefixes and suffixes that make them flow into a sentence, it doesn't make sense at all. But if you meditate on this, I'll make my own little translation that says Elohim is one with his word, two will hear and obey. That is strength to the leaders. Mm -hmm. So, one thing Elohim has spoken um, can also mean Elohim is one with his spoken word. Mm -hmm. He is one with his word. And when he says something, you're actually listening to him. And um, then, oh my brightness goes down. Um, There's also another interpretation um, that can also be translated as there is power in Yahweh's word and strength and unity among leaders if they become one with his word and obey 
that's just a, a interpretation of the words just meditating on that mm -hmm. so just interacting with the word meditating on it can give you different meanings mm -hmm. where the core words is echat tabar elohim mm -hmm. which so, is one yeah. word elohim mm -hmm. So in reality, in reality, the, 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 the written word is a framework and, and each one of us is being spoken to by God mm -hmm. at that particular time, in that particular context, uh, to bring out what he needs to show us uh, yeah. for, your for your need. For your own. need. Yeah. Mm. At the same so it's time, not like it will it's never transgress his truth. Yeah. Like it's not a matter of no, you've because got, it's God. You know, one person has their interpretation of this, and and then we can make it say what we like. It's no, 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 not like and that. I, no, no, I understand. It's still, it's still but, means where it means. Yes, yeah. yeah, but it will be but different. It relates yeah, to yeah, yeah, time it's, it's, and culture, yeah. and yeah, and and, yeah. And, uh, and how it relates to you at this point in time. Mm. Exactly. What yeah. you need to know. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So the concept of the Hebrew thought process is called block logic, where you pick up a three-dimensional block and you look at it from different point of views. So when you look at the three words, let's just do it as a little exercise. Um, echad, dabar, elohim, just those three words. One is echad, dabar is word, elohim is God. Mm. Just those three things. So you can say that elohim is echad, elohim is echad with his word, his word is Echad. It is Elohim's word. So there's many connections you can make with those three words from different point of views, and they're all true. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. They don't contradict one another. Mm. Just thinking yeah. about that from different point of views mm. still and, means mm. something. And yeah, that's that's expressed. Yeah, yeah. That's that scripture in the beginning was the word. The word was Yahweh. Yeah. 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 And he was his word. Mm. And you can also say. Elohim and his word is one. Mm. So Elohim is his word. Mm. So if we're in his image, we are words because he is words. Mm. So that's my next point that I just want to bring up that I thought of uh, this morning is I was looking at the trees just thinking about <laughs> the <Are> word. <laughs> because in the beginning Yahweh spoke and then things came into being but the word speak or spoke and things is the same Hebrew word so that means whatever he said is the thing and the thing is words so when I look at something I look at words and in the mind of Yahweh you can imagine the complexity of all the words that need to describe all the things including color how it relates all the cells blah 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 it's volumes and volumes of volumes of information that will enable him to speak that tree yeah. and that tree now need to obey the word and if that tree obey the word it will manifest exactly that tree yeah. so there is a torah for a tree there's a torah for an animal yeah. and there's also a torah for humans yeah. now we are the only people or the only creations yeah. who's got free will yeah. and we're the only ones who do not obey the Torah of humans mm. and we fell from a higher state mm. because of that animals and trees and all of that they still obedient to their Torah mm. and they haven't fallen from the original state that they're in mm. so just from that context you are the words you allow in your life you manifest that because you are words mm. you're a combination of words and if you allow intertwined truth and lies you will manifest that and you become that mm. that's your essence mm. and in order to become the true dna spiritual representation and the blueprint of what he intended you to be you need to comply with mm. his degrees with his ordinances with his hukat mm. to manifest that mm. so he that's why it's important so, that sorry no no we have first. to wash Renew our minds yes, yes. by the washing to take away the, the cancerous DNA that will yeah. cause you not to manifest the true yes. you. Mm -hmm. So, so what you're talking about? So uh, there's a Torah for man. Yeah. So what's man doing with the Torah? 
He's messing with it. Yes. Mm. He's messing yeah, with it. Taking it away. Adding. Taking away. Adding. Taking away. Removing it completely. Mm. Mm. And that's what this vaccine is all about. Everything's a distraction. And mm. the, is that, oh, no, go on. I was saying, is that that connect to um, Yeshua saying the kingdom of God is within you mm. um, because the kingdom is the, you know, the, the spiritual and the physical mm. coming together again. Yeah. So there's been a, a rift and the, the Torah, everything like the animals and the trees and everything obey their command. It's only us that doesn't. Mm. So we will at that point so that means it's 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 in us to be um in seed form yeah Yeah. in seed form to be birthed at some point to come back into that into alignment so just take that Mm. psalm 62 the three words Mm. elohim is a chat with his words Mm. his words are all his torahs for all his creations Mm. because they all come from him Mm. and when you unify everything back to their original state. Mm. That's the concept of the kingdom. Mm. Because everything will be mm. one again with him mm. in harmony to the true word mm. that he intended for every living thing he spoke into existence. Mm. Is there any significance in the fact that he uh, that Adam named the animals? Yes. Mm. Now speaking the names over them. Uh, so he, that he, rather than um, like he was given that job to do. He was I'm sure a, he was anointed. In yeah, he, he had that great of power to yeah. play. Yeah. Mm. So Yahweh spoke the framework into existence, mm. which is a horse or a this and that. And when you mm. name something, it gives mm. its character and its essence. Mm. All of that. Just like in Hebrew, your name is your character and your destiny. Mm. Mm. In the same way, I think the animal started to get this, its character and its destiny mm. based on its name that was given mm. to them, which is just a additional part of the, the word mm. that was spoken over them. And I was saying to Philip, I guess this is why all the um, famous people dabble in, <coughs> or dab into Kabbalah, Kabbalah now, yeah. mm-hmm. because they know these secrets mm. about creating mm. when you speak. Mm. You know, they've got that. Mm. They, all they do is they're taking Yahweh out of it. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. yeah. They still don't obey his story. They are my creators. My my respect for Hollywood and performing arts production has just completely been Mm -hmm. obliterated with the, you know, with well the comments in regard to to Trump and uh, you know and what's happening in the U.S. and all these virtue signalling rubbish that that comes Mm -hmm. out of it. I used to I used to imagine that someone who is able to create a really compelling character is someone with a, a modicum of intelligence. Mm. But now I'm starting to think they're just parrots. Mm. They're yeah. just, that's all they are. And that's why there's confusion with the brain because they get influence from different yeah. advisors and whatever. But their ego's inflated mm. beyond measure mm. and so they think they can speak for the for all of us, you know. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, been a bit, it's been a bit of an eye out, no? you know. Mm. Yeah, relating to mm. words that were spoken. Mm. You actually see the true person behind the words there, yeah. mm. because there are the words. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So, for us to interpret the word correctly, you need insight or re'e. You need the spiritual ability to decode the code, so to speak. And the only way we can do that is through Yahweh's spirit. Mm. the spirit of truth I'm going to make a very bold statement now which most people will probably not agree with the purpose of Messiah I think one of the highest purposes of Messiah is to allow us to access his spirit now his spirit that was one of the main tasks for his first coming or the, or the result of that because he said, I will go, go away to my father so that mm. the Spirit will come. And there's numerous scriptures in the New Testament because I wanted about the Spirit of Yahweh. That's why I just call it the Spirit of Yahweh because there's verses that says it's the Spirit of the Father. Mm. Then there's other verses that says it's the Spirit of the Son. Mm. And then there's, there's other verses that says it's just the Holy Spirit. Mm. Yeah. Now in accurate, uh, in Greek, 
the ac most accurate translations, doesn't connect a gender to the spirit. It's just the spirit. Mm. Um, so the, the gender aspect is basically more to our minds of how we try to understand things. Mm. But the spirit of Yahweh is just like the Messiah is the arm, the spirit is the hand that mm. fulfill a function mm. through the extension of Messiah. Mm. So he represents the Messiah on the earth, but now through us. Mm. Mm. So, and he gives us the ability, just like Messiah, to have the wisdom, mm. and also to do the things that the Messiah has done. Mm. And the biggest task the Messiah had was to help us not to sin anymore, to overcome sin. And to go back to the word. So that is our highest calling. Is not to sin. To strive towards righteousness and holiness. For obvious reason. Because we want to reconnect with the Father. And, and He's holy. And the other thing is to, to take us back to the word. To the truth. For this very reason we are having this discussion today. Because it's your spiritual DNA that needs to be repaired. Mm. It has been corrupted. The only way to fix this is through His Word. Mm. There's no other way you can be restored. So, what, what are you saying? You preface it by saying, I'm going to say something that's... Uh, just like, the, I believe the highest calling of Messiah was for us to access His Spirit. Yeah, well, I don't mm. find that, to me, I don't find that... Uh, no, some people worship, worship Jesus mm. and that's where it stops. <laughs> oh, I see. He is the end. No, no, it's just a means. Oh, yeah. okay. And the Holy Spirit is another means that yeah. the end is the Father. Yeah. That's the goal. Yeah. 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 So we shouldn't yeah. stop at the yeah. cross. We shouldn't yeah. stop at the mm. uh, like sure. Like, we shouldn't stop at the example of sacrifices, you know, yeah. the, the reason why temple sacrifices had to be done was so people could get back closer to mm. Yah. To draw near. And Yeshua was just the ultimate sacrifice to mm. bring everybody back. Mm. Exactly. His main purpose was to bring us closer, yeah. to remove mm. the energy, yeah. take yeah. away the barrier, mm. to allow us access. Mm. Right. Yeah. Mm. No fool. <laughs> <laughs> for some of our Christian brothers, because people get upset what you say. Yeah. Yeah. Because our audience in Adelaide was 80% Christian. Mm. That was the people, people we taught Torah to, and without mm. them knowing it. Mm. Um, yeah. So... Mm. And well, they the thing, sometimes get upset when you say things like that. Away the, if you want to throw, throw out the Torah, then you have to make Jesus the new God. Yes. Because you have to admit otherwise if the Father is still the top that, that you're aiming for, then you have to accept yeah. what he said. Yeah. That's so right. Sort of yeah. like that. yeah. the, the, the whole, you have to, you have to do not see that the whole plan of God is towards that end. Mm. The yeah. restoration of yeah, humanity. Restoration mm. of relationship with the Father is the mm. end. Is the whole plan. It's not. Mm. Yeah. All right. So interestingly, um, when everything was created, it was created through words. Well, I spoke about last time the the connection between light and sound through the two Hebrew letters Kuf and Lamet that makes the word Kol and Kol. Kol, I think his word in Kol is sound. They share the same Hebrew letters, take away the vowel points, they're exactly the same thing. Mm. So sound and, and light, from a spiritual perspective, is the same thing. It's just, the one is just slow down, mm. so that we can understand it. Mm. And the medium that we understand is words. We don't understand light, mm. because we don't have the insight. And light has got the ability to show you one picture with 10 million facts on it, and mm. you can take all those facts in, in a couple of seconds mm. because it's a picture when you listen to the medium of words you have to sit there for an hour listening or reading mm. it's a slow process where light is a fast process mm. and because we are in a fallen state Yahweh deliberately chose words because we are a bit slow <laughs> in order to explain light concepts to us I just want to add something mm. With what you're saying now, last week or the week before, I watched a documentary mm. on how one perceives reality mm. and how your reality, my reality, can be totally different. Mm. And this guy was explaining that what we see is not really 
what it is. Mm. Our perspective of reality is only because of light and shadow. Mm. That's it. It's mm. Everything that we see is light and shadow, and that gives us a mm. perspective. Based on what we focus on. Based on, yeah. Mm. <laughs> and this, this is exactly and Sometimes you've got yeah. industrial blindness, mm. or you're mm. complacent. There's something, but you don't see it. Yeah. Mm. That's why, like, it, um, it's so hard to choose paint. Yeah, you know, you can look on a colour chart, you put it on the wall, but it depends on the light. Mm -hmm. And, and the very context with mm -hmm. something else, oh, what yeah. it really looks yeah. like. You have to bring it into relation to something. Yeah, that's on its own, it doesn't mean something. It can mm -hmm. even appear as white, mm -hmm. but it's a cream. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that yeah. is why in the morning why you wake up. That's right, yeah. Um, you know, sometimes you wake up and you don't feel too well. It's important to face mm -hmm. the mountain first, which is Yahweh's word, mm. before you face <coughs> the troubles. Yeah. Because your whole day mm. is going to be in mm. that light, in that shape. Yeah, you need to it's bring up Yahweh's yeah. word. Yeah. So you have that to compare all today's happenings to, yeah. mm. to get the right perception. Yeah. Just like you have your color card, mm. all by itself, it will overwhelm you. But you mm. bring it into relation to a white or a cream or whatever. Mm. Oh, this is what this color means. I listened to Grant um, this week when I couldn't sleep, 3 a.m. in the morning. <laughs> and he had a beautiful picture that he explained. I don't know what he explained, but the analogy he used was brilliant. He used the analogy of a box full of oil painting tubes, mm. all nicely packed, Beautifully in array with all the colors. You can see it perfectly. Perfectly. And that's basically the Torah. Mm. The potential, the true colors, everything is black and white, clear. Mm. There's no mixing and whatnot. Mm. And then on the other hand, he had a beautiful painting of a scenery that was made with those colors. Mm. But the middle step was the palette that was a mess. Mm. Because that's where all the colors were mixed, mm. squeezed out, a few of them became dry, you have to squeeze out a few more, mix in a bit of that, pick a bit of that, get a darker tone, whatever. Mm. Now, what we perceive from our perspe perspective is the palette. That is your life mm. Mm. in the physical. Now, the Torah are all the beautiful colors, mm. and the painting is the end result that mm. is in Yahweh's mind. But we get tripped up by situations. Because he's adding a bit of black, mm. he mix it in. Mm. Because you want to do a nice little contour or a little shadow thingy. <laughs> and then you go through a tough time and you kick and scream. You go, ah, oh, you mix black paint with me. I don't like green. Yeah, you just mix it in. Extra oil. Extra <laughs> oil, eh? Yeah. Um, so our life experiences is just this canvas. Mm -hmm. And whatever change comes, it just the palette, means... It's just a palette. Right? Yeah. 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 Oh, just a palette. So any change that comes that might cause you to fear or whatever, mm. don't worry about it. It's just finishing your painting. You just need... <laughs> and you're actually moving to a next level. You're starting a new mm. part of your painting when because you need to add something else. Specific world paintings you can add layer upon layer oh, that's right, yeah. because yeah. stay wet for to get something yeah, to get something mm. I, was, I was just thinking you know layer it always layer. amazes me when you've got say the three primary mm. colors red blue and yellow if you mix only two of them mm. you get a beautiful third color you yeah. know blue and red purple or green but if you mix the three together you get this mucky brown. Yeah. yeah. And I, th I th always found that fascinating. Yeah. Any two, you get a beautiful other colour, but three <coughs> So you have to know what you're doing and what to put together. Yeah. And In relation. And it's all about balance at the end of the day. Mm. How you get the, the real colour out mm. um, that, that you want to use. Wow. Yeah, so that was a, a very beautiful picture. Mm. Now I just want to quickly talk about Genesis 1 verse 3, where Yahweh said, Let there be light. That's a paradox in itself. Because he spoke light into existence. God is light. So how can light speak? And when it's not spoken, it does not exist. It's like mm. the one is creating the other and in, in they're in a little loop. Um, so that in itself is something we can't understand. Mm. But that is what the spiritual realm is about. It's about those paradoxes that we don't understand. 
And when we bring it down to the physical, the one I did the letter Tet in Hebrew of Aleph Bet, you can maybe watch that one. I explain the world of duality. And number nine, um, it has to do with the serpent. Uh, the Tet represents the serpent, which is the opposer. Now, for every force or every action, there's an opposite reaction. For everything in this world, there's an opposing force. Now, opposer is the Hebrew word Satan, Satan, the opposer. So, Satan or the opposer can be Lucifer, but it can also be an angel of Yahweh. Because with Balaam, I think it was Balaam's donkey, he was opposed by angels, and the Hebrew was Satan. So, the angels worked as a Satan, an opposer, which was not Lucifer. So Yahweh can oppose you as well. So that was my normally my warning to Christians. If something go wrong, don't give the credit to Lucifer. Mm. Abusing him and telling him off and he's done this and you bind him and you do this mm. and you do that. No, it probably maybe it was Yahweh who did it. Mm. Yeah. So you need to get your facts right before you jump on your little high horse and try yeah. and wave your scepter and sort mm. things out. <laughs> As if we can. <laughs> <laughs> As if we can, like a little baby. It's funny. I think it's just funny the way we carry on. Because we want to have control. Yeah. The other thing I meditated on this week uh, was just asking the question why. Now, one of the highest drives for us as humans is we want to experience pleasure. We want to avoid pain. That's our highest drive. Mm. If you're hungry... That's a pain. Mm. You want to get rid of that to mm. eat something. Mm. When you're cold, that's painful. Add a blanket. Mm. Um, when you sit uncomfortable, pain. you'll move. So even every move you make, everything is driven by a pleasure mm. or a drive towards pleasure or to a state of that peace okay. where you don't have any pain. Mm. Um, and sometimes when we're comfortable and you don't experience any pain, you become passive. So sometimes Yahweh adds some uncomfortable situations to give you momentum so you can move into a direction. Otherwise, you'll just sit there stagnant and not do mm. anything. And that's where this opposing force also come in mm. from his perspective. Now, looking at the opposing forces, just look at the physical realm. The opposing forces need to exist for life to be sustained. You need heat and cold, light and darkness for plants and life to exist. Without that, life cannot be sustained. So if you take away... oh. I don't like darkness. I don't like cold. Mm. Okay, let's take it away. You will surely die if you do so. Mm. You need the world of duality. You need the opposing forces mm. to sustain life. In the same sense, whenever you are opposed as a human being, you need that to sustain your life. What life? Your spiritual life. Because that opposing force has to do with you moving into a spiritual direction mm. that you need to move into. So all these things that's happening out there with COVID and blah, 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 all those things, they're just opposing forces that need to exist mm. to move humanity into a position or into a motion mm. or into a direction. Mm. And the direction from Yahweh's perspective, because he's in control, we know he's moving towards the River Jordan. Yeah. There's something going to happen. Things mm. need to fall in place. Mm. And even though the wicked thing they do, whatever they think is the mm. right or wrong thing to do, whatever mm. their motives are, Yahweh is in full control mm. and they are working alongside his plan because mm. he hit the perfect shot with a crooked stick and he will always win regardless mm. because he's the one who wrote the end of the book mm. um, in my preparation of the book of yeah. Hebrews mm. I, I go into um, Arminianism and Calvinism mm -hmm. the two extremes that form yeah. the basis of Christianity yeah. Yeah. the one says God is all-powerful, the other one says, I've got free will. The two paradoxes that form 40,000 different denominations mm. because of the nuances in between all of them. Mm. And that, that's the confusion we currently live in because of that. Those things we can't understand because they are spirit. Now, bringing it back down to something we do understand is creation. That's why he wrote everything in the language of creation, of nature and all that. Mm. So we can have the pictures to understand spiritual concepts and when you understand a spiritual concept then you can apply that to your life or allow things to your life or without fear mm -hmm. just watch him do his thing mm -hmm. so um, in that sense uh, just looking at the two trees in the garden 
in saying the two forces that need to exist, like North and South, World Coal, whatever, any opposing force has an energy field in between them, like two magnets. Mm. It's a field. If you move a wire through there, it generates electricity, which is an energy. So opposing forces in the world of duality has energies, whether it's physical energy or spiritual energy, mm. that energy is what sustain all life and they need to exist. In the same way, there were two fruits on one tree that were opposing to one another. Mm. The tree of knowledge, one fruit was knowledge of good, the other fruit was knowledge of evil. That was the premise of the world of duality. But it's a spiritual concept mm. because it exists in <clears throat> the higher dimension in the garden when man interacted with that tree, he fell to the lower state, which is the reality of the world of duality, mm. without the tree of life. And now they're stuck mm. in the middle. So what mm. our purpose is, we're still faced with the two fruits on one tree, mm. and that's basically the Torah. Mm. The Torah is the fruit of uh, the tree of knowledge. In the Torah, there are fruits that are good mm. and there are fruits that are evil. The evil fruits are the, don't do that, mm. nah, I'll do that, I think mm. I'll try that. Mm. Um, or just that out of rebellion, I'm going to do that just to spite Yahweh, mm. whatever you want. So the knowledge of evil sometimes stimulate and motivate people to do those things. And as I said, the reader interacts with the text and cause the person to either do good or evil. Mm. So it's not the text that's wrong. Mm. The text is there to protect us, but it needs to show us what is wrong. But if the reader interacts with it and says, oh, I'm, I'm going to do that, um, it's not the Torah mm. that makes it wrong. Mm. And this is just laying the foundation for what Paul is talking about, where people say, oh, the Torah is abolished, the Torah is mm. evil, the Torah is wrong. Uh, but the Torah just tells you what sin is. Mm. That's the, the fruit, the knowledge of evil. Um, so we need to learn to eat from the fruits that are the knowledge of what is good, which is basically his commandments, mm. positive commandments. Negative commandments is avoid things that are evil. That's negative commandment. Mm. And it's sometimes easier to well, do negative, negative commandment to avoid something or not mm. to do something because I just have to be passive mm. and then I'm holy. Yeah. But Yahweh said, no, you can't lock yourself in a dark closet mm. and be holy. You need to do positive mm. commandments as mm. well. There's an active side mm. to his commandments as well. To do good, to good to your neighbor, care for one another, look after one another. Mm. Um, so that aspect is also there. So in saying all of that, the, the one tree with the two fruits, there was actually two trees with three kinds of fruit. The third fruit was the fruit of life, the chet of chukat. And life exists because of duality. So my assumption I make, which you might disagree with, is the tree of life exists because of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The tree of life exists because of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Right. Because life can only be sustained by the forces of duality, which is the fruit of evil and the fruit of good. But if you take away the balance of interacting and making choices regarding the fruit of good and the fruit of evil, you will not sustain life. So life, the tree of life, is the consequence of you interacting with that tree with imperfect balance or not. If I believe in only grace... Mm. I will destroy my children mm. because mm. they will not know discipline. Yeah. Mm. If I believe in only the other side, the mm. latter, mm. I will destroy people because I don't have love and grace. Mm. So it's all about the balance regarding truth. Mm. And balanced truth is interacting with the tree of knowledge of good and evil with a perfect balance. And that's why we need our spirit. And then life will come forth mm. then you have access to the tree of life mm -hmm. which is the consequence fruit of that and mm. that's why it's also called the fruit of the spirit mm. the fruit of the spirit is the spirit helping me to eat from the two fruits that's available within the right balance so that life can be the consequence of my choices mm. and actions mm. so so I'll just make sense. And the two fruits and then the third tree, the tree of life. So when they're turfed out of the garden, in case they ate of that 
tree. The, the Adam and Eve. I'm thinking of the. I'm just trying to get my head around what you're saying. No, so, what I'm saying is another point of view of the same thing. What yeah. you believe is also right. Um, I just have another point of view of the same no, thing. No, no, yeah. I'm. I'm, I'm yeah, so one of the, the, the teachings out there is that they were removed from the garden so they will not eat from a tree of life and live, and live forever in, that in, a, sinful in state. a fallen state. Right. Right. Yes, okay, that yes. is true. Yeah, okay. And, and on top of that, there's, they couldn't have that, the life thing in, their proper, in, their, in a purified state without the two fruits and making choices. That's why that tree was yeah. in the garden. Because yeah. it had to be there. Yeah. It's not there to trip them up. It's there because it's a spiritual thing. Mm. Paradoxes and duality is a spiritual thing. It needs to be there. It's, it's spiritual. But in also saying that, mm. talking about or bringing it back to our previous conversation, outside of the garden, we still have access to the tree of knowledge of good and evil, which is basically our story. Mm. And sometimes the story is built within us. Mm. Even... Uh, people in the Gentiles, they know what morality is, they know mm. what is good and bad. It's mm. built into us, the mm. basic framework of that. Mm. But because we're in a fallen state, we lose balance. We either go this way or that way, and then there's no life. Mm. So for the restoration process of the tree of life to manifest in your life, you need to learn perfect balance in interacting with mm. truth. For example, the verse that says, we should fear Yahweh. And we should love Yahweh. Mm. Fear, and, fear and love is opposites of mm. one another. The one pull you, the other one push you. Mm. So if I just believe in I'm fearing Yahweh, I'm only pushed towards Him. I don't know Him. Mm. There's no attraction towards Him. Mm. I'm just scared of Him. That's turn and burn. Mm. That's <laughs> turn and burn. I lost my balance completely and there's no fruit of life. And even my interaction with other people mm. will have the same fruit. Mm. So the fruit of my spirit will be bad. Mm. But if I only believe in loving God, but not respecting Him, mm. out of fear, mm. I will lose balance and I will only cling on to grace. Mm. And I don't care about the Torah, I don't care about mm. this, He's my mate, He's my chummy, whatever. Mm. Um, yeah. You lose complete balance mm. and... But you need to fear Yahweh and you need to love Him, but there's a sweet spot, there's a balance. Yeah. And only His Spirit can tell us what that balance is. Mm. Mm. And it's the observer or the reader mm. who will need yeah, to find that balance. You can't come up with a checklist. Yeah. No. Mm. It's not that easy. Yeah. And that's why it's a life and experience. That's, and, and that's why it's also interactive. It's an interactive language, mm. interactive faith. Mm. We always have to do something. Mm. You know, interact with one, interact with one another. Mm. Yeah, so that we can yeah. live. Mm. 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 Oh, that's um, the dumb thing is is it is the key because um, I mean, uh, on the journey, on the walk of you know getting to this point, um, being aware of it, saying you know the Bible saying fear God, and on the other hand, you know loving. God, you think it's one or the other, and, it's and if, you, if it's a, yeah, it has to be both. Yeah. yeah Greek thinking mm -hmm. is it's one mm -hmm. or the other. Hebrew thinking mm -hmm. is it's both, both but within yes. a certain balance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. our journey and mm -hmm. our purpose is to find the balance within every topic, every yeah. situation where there's truth involved. Mm -hmm. Now, if we just go back to the fallen state, we face with the tree with the two fruits: mm -hmm. fruit of good, fruit of evil. Um, the balance is out of whack. I don't have an understanding of what the balance should be. Mm. I need help. Mm. And that's why I need His Spirit to help me find mm. the balance. Mm. And when I find the balance, I can then get elevated yeah. in that certain situation. Yeah, I see that in day-to-day -day life, you know, like in a work. I can get to the point of being driven and I'm less effective in what mm. I do. Mm. Or I can just coast and, uh, you know, but be lazy and also and, and, and it also e either way yeah. brings you to a dark place mm. but then there's but, a, a, an attraction mm. a passion but if you pull you if you if you're looking for the the sweet spot spot you're saying i call it the zone yeah those times and 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 i'm always aiming to get there but not always it's always mm. 
never quite there, but they are, you'd have yourself those times when, when it's just, everything's just flowing. Mm. You, and you're so productive. Yeah, you're in the flow. You're in the flow. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's just yeah. happened automatically. You know, one thing just fall and flow. And you're not, you're, not, you're not, not anxious about getting anything done. Uh, you know. But you're getting things and you're done. Not, <laughs> and you're not regretting uh, not having more leisure. Or it's, everything is just mm. part of this flow of life. That's yeah. so wonderful, isn't it? And that balance also applies to your spiritual walk. Because you can... Be extremely fanatical about the word and about the truth mm. and neglect your family. Mm. Mm. So everything in this life is about balance because we're in a world of duality. If you move too much towards the cold, mm. you'll be frozen over. If you move too much to the hot, you'll be burned up. Mm. Mm. So you need to find the perfect balance where the temperature is perfect or the light is perfect. Mm. If you move too much into the light, it blinds you. If you move too mm. much in the darkness, you'll you can't see anything. Yeah. No, you're just as good as yeah. being blind. You're blind in both extremes, actually. Mm. Yeah, yeah, so it's all about balance mm. at the end of the day. Mm. So the, the mystery of the kuf to enter through that gate is balance. Because it's between life and death, the chet and the taf. Mm. And the tree of knowledge of evil will lead to death. The tree of knowledge of good will lead to life. Mm. But the balance will let you enter in through the kuf. Mm. Mm. And that's what the ordinances are all about. Mm. Yahweh's commandments and Yahweh's word is about to teach us to find the balance. In every way. In every way. Mm. In every area of our life. Mm. And as I said, the Torah is written with little stories and pictures and whatnot. Mm. There's patterns, there's different things. Um, and they can be applied in every culture, any time frame. Mm. And it transcends mm. uh, all that because it's it's spiritual technology mm. uh, in his in his words specifically in the Hebrew. Alrighty, and the next thing is the mystery of the red heifer. Mm. Now the red heifer is a paradoxical um, idea in itself because the priest who perform the ritual of cleansing on someone that's unclean, he becomes unclean. It's the only sacrifice that's upside down. The others, when you perform a sacrifice, the one who's facilitating that stays clean. And the one who's benefiting from that becomes clean. Mm. But the red heifer is the other way around. And rabbis, even Solomon, could not understand the mystery of the red heifer. Mm. Um, and they wrote lots and lots of things um, mm. in their volumes and volumes mm. of... Um, Documents and books and Mishnah and. So, Tom, can you just go that again? So, normally the the um, the priest uh, stays clean. So, what happens with the red heifer thing again? I know I read it, but he I can't becomes, remember. He becomes unclean. The, the, yeah, the priest. Yes, the priest becomes unclean. The sacrifice. Yeah. The process. Of makes the, him unclean. Makes him unclean. Makes him unclean. Yeah. Whereas yeah. normally a. Sacrifice makes somebody clean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, that's interesting. Now, I'm, I'm wondering that when I was reading, I think that's mm. weird. Weird, yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Now, every time in scripture, it's just like an x ray when a doctor looks at an x ray. When they analyze the body and they take an x ray of the body, they know what the perfect rib cage and the perfect mm. vertebra and everything should look like. And when they take a picture of yours and they put it up there and there's a, not, a, uh, a difference. Mm. They know, oh, we need to zoom in there. Mm. Now the same with the Torahs. When there's anything that seems to contradict each other or anything that is like that doesn't make sense. Mm. doesn't fit the pattern. Surely mm. it must be wrong or I don't understand it. Mm. Uh, that's where Yahweh draws your attention to mm. that. That means it's important. So paradoxes in scripture, I know there's a lot of pagans out there who bash the, the, the scripture mm. because of um, paradoxes, paradoxes or mm. things that contradict one another. Discrepancies yeah. or it's yeah. there for a purpose. Mm. It's deliberate for the reader to draw their attention to something. Mm. It's not an error. You know, mm. We put it in mm. there for a reason. And in the context of the truth, it does not alter the truth whatsoever. Mm. It's just a little nuance that's slightly different to something else mm. that you're used to. 
and that's just to catch your attention. Mm. Now the red heifer is, is just like that, it just catch our attention and it um, is one of the decrees that are fitting the bill regarding the paradoxes and uh, the duality. Now the Talmud HaMet um, is the word that says that the great the red heifer is one of the greatest mysteries um, that they can't explain even to this day mm -hmm. it's only through the help of Yahweh's spirit that we can make that connection and we are going to make that connection I'm sure you might just like already say, you know because you just carry on now <laughs> yeah I know I know the, I know the answer okay. yes. <laughs> yes it's all to do when you, when you it, it's all to do with <laughs> have you read no have you, you'd have to know that it's uh, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Have you seen, have you read that? Oh, seen the movie? Sorry. So what? They get the supercomputer yeah. to find out the meaning of existence. Yeah. And they have to wait and wait and wait and everyone... Uh, I'm pretty sure I've, it's a long time since I read it. So, they, uh, in the end, they're all waiting for this answer and it's 48. <laughs> <laughs> so what now? Okay, so because it's such a mystery, the Jews believe that it's connected to the Messiah and his coming. Mm -hmm. And he said only he will give us the key or the answer to that. Mm -hmm. And they also believe that the appearing of a red heifer is associated with, his, with, an, with the coming of Mashiach. Mm -hmm. Now it's recorded in the Mishnah that there have been nine red heifers since Moses. Oh, since nine? Nine, yes. Since Only. General, since Moses. Yeah, I think it's Moses. Let me just quick jump. I've got all the names of all the guys that, makes sense, the, that they recorded. Becoming unclean. Which mm. is the they only had the snake nine yeah. from, sorry, up and until the destruction of the second temple, there have been nine uh, red heifers. And the first one was given by Moses himself. And they've recorded every single red heifer that was ever Gosh. used for cleansing rituals mm. since then. And there were only nine. Gosh. So they believe that the next one, which will be the tenth, mm. is linked to the coming of Messiah. Mm. So it's very significant, the number ten as well. It means completion. Now the reason the red heifer is so important for them is they, the red heifer is required to have an effective priesthood because they need to be cleansed. Mm. Also, the area needs to be cleansed for mm. the building of the temple. Mm. So you can't build the next temple without the red heifer. Mm. And there haven't been a red heifer in the last 2000 years, but there appeared three since, 2000, uh, since 1997. The first one was 1997, mm -hmm. and the second one was 2002, and they were both declared kosher by the Temple Institute. And they recently have a third one that they found. So to them, it's a sign. We haven't seen any mm. red heifer wow. since the destruction of the mm. second temple, wow. which was um, the ninth one. In mm. 2000 years, there was none. And now there's three. three. Mm. So the coming of Messiah must be very close. So mm. is a red heifer just born to any old heifer? Or, no. or do they just come out of the wilderness somewhere? Or? No, they, they, they from, from farmers, they them. try to breed it as well. So breed the colour. Is this the only... Uh, uh, sorry. Well, so it's funny how they can breed colours of everything else, but there's one particular animal, they can't breed a perfectly red one. Yes, they can't. <laughs> so what happens is they breed them, but usually there's a white head here and here. Yeah. Or okay. a black head. Oh. Like, there shouldn't yeah. be more than... They one black hair it. on that whole cow. Oh. Wow. That's that's when they declare it kosher when there's no black hair. Oh. No black hair, no white hair, no grey. No must be only all wow. mm. mm. And they are very wow. detailed wow. when they die, look at these I can things. Imagine. Yeah, I can imagine. I, I can read that picture on Facebook, and they think they've been saying they've they've just inspected some red heifers, and they're inspecting the red heifers and they have just inspected some red heifers and they are Expecting some more or something, and they're getting excited. So. Yes. Yeah. 
And there's yeah. more and more of them born, so they keep on. Wow. So to them, it's a little wake-up call. Mm. To us, understanding the time frame of this book, the previous mm. Torah portion we discussed, like two, two or three back, was mm. getting closer to the to the border of the Promised Land, and also about um, drawing closer mm. to the, um, the the River Jordan which depicts the, the tribulation and the second coming of Mashiach. So even the context mm. of this topic within this book, mm. within this um, time frame, prophetic. is all prophetic. It's not just a coincidence. And that's why this book is supernatural mm. in a sense, because it gives us even a prophetic view of what is coming with the topics within mm. to the generation that live in that time. Mm which is us. Mm. So, and uh, the, it's very evident to our Jewish brothers um, and they are very excited about mm. the second coming of Mashiach. What's the other rabbi that we watched? Um, Al Alon. He's got a long yeah. beard. He's Was that the one you said? Uh, mm. Yeah, he teaches um, yeah. about end times to the Jews. Mm. And there's a lot of secular Jews who become religious again because of him. Yeah. There's a great awakening in their faith because of him yeah. and because of the end times of things Turning that happen. Turning back to Torah. Yeah, his own, his own compromise. Yes. Yeah, and he's I very into conspiracy. He's all right, but, you know. yeah. Yeah. but he's a, definitely a voice. Mm. Yeah. And together with the people, of course, from the Temple Institute, mm. who's also advocating um, mm. that message mm. very loudly and clearly. Um, to their um, nation or, or faith, so mm. to speak. All right, so the red heifer, the mystery um, we talked about, and the purification. Um, now, what's interesting is that the, the red heifer, the symbolism of the red heifer, and some of the things used there is similar to the uh, cleansing of the leper. Now, in Leviticus 14, it talks about cedar wool, and scarlet and hyssop that's used to sprinkle mm. and the same ingredients are basically found when preparing and sprinkling um, the, no, the red heifer for mm -hmm. cleansing mm. but the one conducting the cleansing of the leper doesn't become unclean that's the only difference mm. but the symbolism and the, the mm. purpose is the same there's also a number seven involved um, the verse in numbers um, which is very interesting. It says in Numbers 19, 11, 13, He who touches a dead body of a man shall be unclean seven days. He shall purify himself with water of purification, which is the water with the ashes of the red heifer, on the third day. And on the seventh day he shall be clean. But if he does not purify himself on the third day, then the seventh day he shall not be clean. Whoever touches the dead body of any man that is dead and purifies himself, or purify, and not purify himself, defiles the tabernacle of Yahweh, and that soul shall be cut off from Israel. Mm. So from a prophetic point of view, we've got the seventh day there. They have to do the, the sprinkling on the third day for preparation to be clean on the seventh. Mm. So you can't just wait, oh, seventh day, I'll just stand there in line and... Mm. Sprinkle unclean, in you go, my faithful servant, come into my joy, go through the gate of Ephraim. Mm. It's not like that. You have to be sprinkled on day three, so that means it's just the same as what we said previously. Going into a feast is all about the preparation. Mm. Preparing for the millennium, the seventh millennium, mm. where the Messiah will reveal his kingdom and allow us into his kingdom. Mm. You should have got your sprinkling before that. It's too late when you stand in front of the gate mm. expecting a sprinkle. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> it's not going to happen. Mm. Yeah. And he said, if you enter, you will defy the temple and you will be cut off from the children of oh, Israel. Okay. Mm. So it's all about the, the ten virgins, five foolish, five mm. wise. Mm. Those who had the oil, they prepared. Yeah. The foolish ones, last minute, hey, hey, what's the red <laughs> sprinkle, sprinkle, <laughs> it'll start. Or... Give me some oil. Mm -hmm. It's too late. You can't have an instant conversion and an instant restoration happening because you're slow. 
Mm. You need a lot of words mm. to go through your mind, to change mm. your mind, to change your being, mm. to restore your soul. Because you have been defiled. It's not the camera flash. Ka-ching. Now you're a new mm. man. It's not <laughs> men in black. That's a good magic prayer. Yeah, it doesn't work that way. Mm. So we need to go through the refining <coughs> process of the washing of the water of the world so that the DNA mm. restoration, the mm. spiritual mm. restoration can take place. Mm. On the third day, now the mm. number three, relates to covenant. Mm. So that means you need to be in covenant prior to this time. You can't mm. have an instant conversion and an instant I'm part of the covenant and then an instant sprinkle and then you enter. Mm. Mm. You need to be in that walk already in order to benefit mm. from that purification that need to happen over time in your life mm. through accessing the word and applying the word. Mm. So that's, uh, that's the true. connection with the virgins. So that's the mystery of the red heifer. What? Day three, day seven. Oh. It's all about preparation. It's all about mm. pre-cleansing, pre-purification, pre-holiness. Holy, mm. That's why Yahweh said, be holy for I am holy. Mm. That word is given to us now. Mm. Not day seven, but day three. Mm. The wow. day after the covenant was revealed through Mashiach. Mm. From that time on, that is the day three where you can access that. And the other link to the red heifer is that Yeshua represents the mm. heifer as well. Mm. Because I've got a picture. I probably need to show you the picture. Otherwise, you won't understand what I'm talking about. I'll zoom in. I'll come around to show you my little picture. That is the location of the sacrifice place of the red heifer in relation to the temple. You can see there's the temple. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's a bridge. And they sacrificed the red heifer there. Mm. So there's a line of sight into the temple through the gate. Yeah. They call it the triple mm. gate. Mm. Mm. So that's where they sacrifice the red heifer. There's a bridge. At the end of the there's bridge. There's a gate and there's a temple. So they believe that Yeshua oh, this was is outside. The outside. Yeah. This is where they did the red heifer. Oh, outside the city. Really and there's a line of sight into the temple. So they believe that Yeshua was crucified on exactly the same spot the red heifer was always sacrificed and when the veil torn they could stand on that spot look across the bridge into through the temple into the holy of holies because the veil that, is not like that the veil is like, like what that it's a curtain like this so it's stripped it's on the huge, top and it huge. fell down it's a veil on this side and a veil on that side Oh, oh, it's a pole this with a two-layer curtain, yeah. so when the high priest goes in, he goes on one that. side, oh, walk I through and like enter that. the oh. exit the other side. So he won't expose. It's like the two-door thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You have to walk between the two curtains. Yeah, no, I think it was 12-inch yes. pole. Between the two curtains and that mm. tore on top and it fell down to the ground. Oh, okay. That makes more sense. So then they could say, <laughs> and watch right through from that yeah. position. If, just a question, if they've if the only been, and up to quite modern times, you said nine all up, so six red heifers, how were they able to um, keep the commandments then? No, that was, no, it was nine up until the destruction of the temple. Oh. The the set, temple since then, temple. nothing since 1997. Right. Now, up to nine. Right, no, yeah. there was nothing from the destruction of 70 AD yeah. till 1997. Yeah. And, then again, again, no. right. and since 1997, three. Yeah. 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 But, but hmm. oh, none since then. So from, from the time that this command no, was given, no they, temple. They didn't need one. No, oh, there's no temple. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. They need one to build the next temple. Right. And that's why they get excited now mm. to get red heifers. Right. Okay. They put everything. Everything except mm. for the temple. Mm. Right. Mm. Yeah. And this was, um, oh, and the other thing, the connection to Messiah was the red heifer and the goats of Yom Kippur yeah. were the only sacrifices done outside of the city. Mm. And the, the sacrifice of the goats was also mm. made so at the same spot. Mm. spot. Yeah. That's so Yeshua represents those two sacrifices. Mm. And those two sacrifices then link to the, the scripture in Samuel, where there was a sacrifice of two heifers, two red heifers. Mm. You know about that one? No, I remember. Um, uh, 
Second Samuel 6. So read it. What was the context? I'll read it. It's when they brought back the the, the, the ark. Oh, oh yes. yes, yeah, yeah. So it says, now therefore make a new cart, take two milk cows, which is the heifer, mm. two heifers, which were never been yoked, and hitch the two cows to the cart and take their calves away, uh, calves home, away from them. Then take the ark of Yahweh and set it on the cart, and put the articles of gold which you are returning to him. Um, a trespass offering and chest by its side then spend it away and let it go and watch if it goes up the road onto its own territory to Beth she uh, she uh, Semesh then he has done us a great evil now the people from Beth Shemesh were reaping um, their wheat harvest in the valley now what's interesting is that the word Beth Shemesh means the house of the sun. And when I look at the word Shemesh, a uh, sun like sun, light, light sun. It talks about the sun rising or the sun setting. So I thought <laughs> it's going to the house of the sun. There's a song, house, 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 rising house, sun. House, house. And that's basically what Shemesh, Beth Shemesh means, is house of the rising sun. <laughs> this is a, a brothel, this is a little something here. Yeah. <laughs> That's why there's male temple <laughs> prostitutes. <laughs> That's Kodesh. Um, <laughs> but the connection to Shemesh is the first verse that used the word Shemesh or sun was in Genesis 15 where the sun went down and great darkness came upon Abraham and then Yahweh cut the covenant with him um, fast asleep. Mm -hmm. So Shemesh is linked to the cutting of the covenant with Abraham. So it's a covenant connection. Mm -hmm. And the Ark of the Covenant is connected to it as well. Mm -hmm. There's two red heifers connected to it as well. Mm -hmm. And um, the people were reaping their harvest. Reaping a harvest has to do with the Jordan, has to do with judgment. And then it talks about later, they split the wood from the cart and uh, the box of where the ark was carried into, they used that as the firewood on the stone where they did the harvest. Mm -hmm. Now, how they did the harvest, the word cart means to go in a circle. Mm -hmm. So they had this big stone that the, the heifers or the whatever animals turned mm -hmm. a stone upon a stone and then they crushed uh, the, the wheat of the harvest on that stone. Mm. Now, they used that stone as the platform to burn the cart and the box, mm. to sacrifice the heifers on the stone, which is the grinding stone. Now, the grinding stone is also linked to the word bar, bar means sun, mm. S-U-N, not, no, S -S sorry, S-O-N. <laughs> the word sun means sun, it means the uh, air, like um, the air of, uh, Kingship. Mm. It also means to cleanse and to purify. Oh. And it also um, means, um, what has I've got here? I lost my thought of train now. Bar and stone. Oh, it's, it's to do with um, the cleansing. Mm. So the word sun, oh, oh, it means to, I've got a picture of that. I can't pronounce the word. Winnowing. Oh, yeah. Winnowing. Yeah. Now, winnowing. Is if you yeah. throw the mm -hmm. yeah and the, 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 like a fan, the, you it? beat it and you throw it up in the wind mm -hmm. and then the chaff so blows away, the blows away yeah. in the wind mm -hmm. and that's the meaning of bar as well oh. of sun. Oh. Now I, I came across this when I studied Hebrews because he's the son of God, so I wanted to know what sun means. Oh. So the sun is connected to cleansing and cleansing is connected to the red heifer. The winnowing of the harvest is connected to the big stone. It's connected to the offering of the two heifers that is being done with the house of the sun, which is the sun setting verse that's connected to the covenant that was cut with Abraham. <laughs> so there's a lot of connections. Yeah. <laughs> and it's about bringing the ark back. And the people rejoiced because they are now able to access the covenant again. Mm. 
because the temple is going to be restored. And the harvest in, yeah. also. And the harvest the coming in. Oh, and the harvest relating to Abraham is yeah. the father of many, all the many people that are coming oh. from the Gentiles. They are the harvest mm. and coming in. The um, Sukkot. Mm. Mm. So why did, why, mm. why did they sacrifice two, two. and not just the one? Why? I think the two heifers relates to the two sacrifices. Um, the one relates to the cleansing sacrifice of the heifer, the cleansing purification. The other one is um, the Yom Kippur sacrifice of the two goats. It's just overlaying sacrifices to heifers, to goats. Well, I, don't know. Well, I think you're saying it's just, but I think you maybe, you know, you do it. Yeah, if you overlay things and they both yeah. sacrificed outside mm -hmm. the temple at the mm -hmm. exact same spot, and Yeshua represent both of them, and the one goat was taking away the sin. Mm -hmm. It's cleansing. Mm -hmm. The other one paid for the sin mm -hmm. um, through the blood. So, but there will be a deeper meaning. Yeah, so the connection is there. Um, but I haven't got too deep into that. Mm. The thing that stood out for me is... There was also the second attempt too. It was like, yeah, it could be connected to that. I don't know. Or it can be a first cleansing oh, and a second no, cleansing. Mm. No, that, because they used the, they used the heifers to, to, to pull the... The cart. The, the cart. cart. You need to. Yeah, that's right. right. Otherwise yeah. it's unyoked. Otherwise, yeah. And that's a link to the yoke. And if yeah. you look about the yoke, Mm. is you are the one on the one end and, and Mashiach sure is the one on the other mm. end mm. so the other effort represents you mm. that's another one mm. I've got it's probably got a whole mm. yeah. <laughs> there's a whole little rabbit trail that goes into that yeah. I actually got that link here I just need to find it quickly it is in here where is it uh, and amazing that Samuel knew what to do because mm, yeah. because you know, they can do something, someone in a, that sort of position of profit, if he just made that up himself. But that's the thing, yeah. they knew mm. Torah, they mm. knew how things were supposed to be, and that's mm. why they did these yeah. things. Yeah. Mm. And now, us with our Greek minds, mm. it's trying to interpret yeah. the scriptures in yeah. the way we think yeah. it's supposed to be, mm. without knowing Torah. Yeah. Mm. And it's and it's all our own doctrines. Yeah, that's right. Mm. Oh, I missed it. I don't know where it is. It's too many things in here. But anyway, so that that's also interesting. Just the sacrifice of the heifer, the harvest. The harvest also point to this point in time mm. um, before the coming of mm. Mashiach, relating to the stone, to the sun, mm. to all those connections and the purification. Mm. But what's most fascinating, if you just look at the word Son of God, in the word Bar, it represents everything he's done. He's the one who purifies, who cleanses, who's the hair, who's, who's, gonna, who's, who's the king, who took the kingship. Yeah. Mm. Um, he's the one who removes the wheat from the chaff, mm. who separates. Mm. He's the judge. That's mm. the concept of that. Mm. And if you add the letter Aleph to it, it becomes bara, that means to create. He's the word that creates everything. Mm. So, but he could only be the creator when you connect him to the Aleph, which is Yahweh. Mm. So it's the combination of the mm. two that actually mm. uh, made the creation possible and because he's the word he was the actual medium that was spoken mm -hmm. which is a person if you think about that yeah. mm -hmm. um, so everything that we see here has got messiah in it mm -hmm. because it was spoken through him mm -hmm. it's got his fingerprints on it mm -hmm. we were, this is now many many years ago we were sitting with friends from our living room back in south africa it just blew my mind without even knowing Torah back mm. then, you know, but um, realizing the concept of Messiah is in everything. Mm. Mm. He's the glue that keeps everything together. Mm. Yeah. And that's when I said to them, this is then when you can even love your enemy. Mm. You know? When you can love that one who even sinned against you because if you realize mm. that Messiah is the glue that keeps every single cell together. It's easy to forgive and to love and to love. It blew my mind. I couldn't get over it. And then in the end, when everything's destroyed, the only thing that's going to be destroyed is stuff that's not of him. Everything else will be consolidated back to Eckhart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
It's interesting, the um, purification, so, um, be holy because I am holy. Um, if you think of the doctrine that we've been taught is, I am holy, so you don't have to be. Yeah. yeah. That's the... It's the don't be wrong. Yeah. 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 I don't know so you don't need to, you know, that's that's almost the same. That sounds the same as like the Hebrew, where you change one little thing because it yeah. sounds so much alike. Yeah, yeah. it sounds, yeah, it sounds, yeah. It's so, yeah. So yes, another little connection that I forgot to tell you about the the sacrifice of the cleansing of the leper in connection to the cleansing of the heifer. Now the leper had two birds. Now the birds is the word tipur, which is tariq peiresh. Tariq is the word for righteousness. It also means pure to clean and it means holy. So it's to do with purification. And the word par means heifer. So now the birds and the heifer are basically interconnected. Because mm -hmm. um, today we, uh, in um, the story of Balak and Balaam, it says, um, I think it's Balak, son of Tipur. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we just had a bit of a chat saying, what was it? Because Tipur is, you know, it was Moses. Moses well, I'm like, well, I wonder what that means. And, um, well, there it is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it means the red heifer and righteousness mm -hmm. because of purification and cleansing. Support. Yeah. I think that was Belam son of Tipur, wasn't it? Can't remember. Belam son of Tipur. Tipur, Tipur. Yeah. Belam son of Tipur. So that's just something interesting. Oh, yeah, of course. And the gates. Oh, and then the question: Why is the heifer female and Yeshua's male? Yet another paradox. What did you say? The heifer is a cow. Yeah. Yeshua is male. Mm. The word Yeshua? No, Yeshua is no, male. He's, he's a, it was male. not a female, it was male. Mm. So no, why no, no. why is it can be gender. why is there a difference? <laughs> <laughs> what is the only thing? sacrifice that's female? Or the no, there's another one. Tough, the, the, the sin offering is female mm. and Yeshua is male. Oh. So why is that? Because he represents the sin offering of Yom Kippur, which is a goat, which is male. Not the daily sin, uh, not the sin offering in the normal Oh, so the, because the, um, the intentional, in, intentional sin as opposed to unintentional. Yeah, the, the one is for the nation, which is mm. Yom Kippur. The other one is for the personal. Mm. So he did it for the nations. Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah. Which more to do with the consequences of. The other one dealt with the sin itself. Mm. Of the individual. Okay, so the heifer. So what the rabbis believe, we have to trust the rabbis on this because they know a lot. Um, they say that any person, specifically males, we just want to talk about males now because that's in question. Why was Yeshua connected to a female offering heifer? Um, they say that every person has got a male and a female phase in their lives now your male phase is up to the age of 18 for males up to the age of 18 yeah then you're in your male phase now the male phase relates to the biological makeup of a man a man can produce lots of seed a woman has limited seed she's born with only a, how many seeds she's got no, no, doesn't know but it's limited male unlimited so what they say is that men has got lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of ideas. But there come a point in their life where they reach maturity where will, they will take one idea and bring it into life. Mm. A woman will take a male, can produce seed very quickly. A female take nine months mm. to bring that seed into life. So... Male versus female. Male seed, he can produce it rapidly. A woman produces life from the seed, life not the seed. immediately, mm. takes nine months. Yes. So they normally say that if a man's got an idea, you have to test it with his wife because she will take that one idea that she thinks is a good idea and then bring it to maturity. help him to bring that into life. Right. That's one aspect. The other aspect is that when you reach maturity, you reach your female phase of your life 
where you can take one idea oh, and bring cool. it into existence mm, wow, through a process and it will take a, a period of time mm. but you don't do that when you're immature mm-hmm. so in the context of Yeshua his male face was all the things that he's done and all the symbolism being the lamb and preaching and miracles and all of that it's a lot of things that happened in a short period of time but the sacrifice that he did was the mature face the female face that has a long uh, period of effect mm. upon humanity. So it's, okay. it's, it's one idea. It's not miracles and this, that and the other. It's mm. one concept that's got a very big impact. And the consequence of that is life mm. to many people. So that's why it is a female. Mm. Well, that also says mm-hmm. that um, when, he, um, when he weeps over Jerusalem and uh, says... I, you know, as another hen, I wish to mm. take each as a female yeah. Yeah. being, which is, you know, I think, a male woman almost, uh, I want, yeah, maybe as a, as a hen. Yeah, the, yeah. the one of Yahweh's names is, is the breasted one. Mm-hmm. It's a female concept, mm. emerging. Mm. So there's no male and female with Yahweh, because he's got both. Mm. And I believe before Yahweh separated Adam, Adam and Chava from mm. Adam, mm. Adam was like Yahweh. Mm. He had both um, attributes. attributes. Well, I think it's only because he came because of shadow and light that we, the gender, to us, that's the only way we relate. It's a spiritual concept. Mm. Yeah. Your soul is a spiritual concept. It's got nothing to do with the yeah. body. Mm. And then you can ask yourself, uh, am I going to be male or female? You can't ask that. When I'm, when I'm up there, we don't know. <laughs> well, I think we're, know, we're, we're going to be t- totally different creatures. Yes. Because he referred to us as the bride, but I'm male. How does that work? Yeah. 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 So that's what it's I'm a saying. function. It's a spiritual concept. Yeah. It's, a yeah. it's a function. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's about a realm where there, is no, where there is no duality. Mm. Eh? It's a realm where there is no duality. Yeah, so it's a realm of unity. Beyond this realm. Yeah. It's relative to us in this realm. Mm. 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 All right. And have you heard about the red heifer and the miracle of the marriage feast, which is Yeshua's first miracle? He did. The connection to the red heifer there. No. 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 (laughs) Anyway, his first miracle was the marriage feast. The question is, why did he do a a miracle Mm. making people drunk? (laughs) <laughs> the first chance he's got doing a miracle is doing that. Why didn't he <laughs> heal a blind man? Or <laughs> why, why, why? It doesn't make sense. Yet another paradox. Mm-hmm. So it's something we don't understand. It's a purification. Yeah, and he uses the purification. The water jugs. Yeah, water jugs. but they're not. But that weren't they not? They weren't just water jugs. They were purification vats, weren't they? Yeah, they were waters of purification. Mm. They had the ashes of their red heifer in them. Mm. Mm. Oh. Yeah, that's why it's called the waters of purification. Those. Mm. Yeah, and, and the scripture says the purification of the Jews. Um, the water pots, um, six stone water pots there, according to the purification of the Jews. So they had... Um, were they going to do a, a, a cleansing ritual? No, the purification of the Jews, whenever you touch something dead and you want to go into the That's temple, right. you have to purify yourself. Yeah. Yeah. That is the water of purification. Water. With right. the ashes of the red So it's not about washing your hands before dinner so kind of water. So, so each house had their own things. Is that what you're saying? No, I don't it's think these one. six stone water pots were located at every house. I mm. think it's water they pots. It's a community the that they fetched from somewhere mm. and brought it to it. Or it might have been, if they were having a wedding, it might have been a community wedding in, yeah, in a community. Yeah. Uh, well, they didn't have synagogues then, but in a, in a community gathering place. And probably the, the waters of purification weren't located at the temple. I think mm. because you wanted to purif- purify lepers and people who contact with the dead, you want them as far as away from the temple as you can. Mm. Mm. So I don't think it was located well, it was at Kana the temple. anyway, it wasn't Jerusalem. Yeah, wherever it was. Yeah, mm-hmm. not the temple. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it was not local. Uh, oh. 
located at the temple, I believe. Anyway, so just the, the concept of the marriage feast. Um, I think through this miracle, Yahweh draws our attention to the end first, before he reveals the beginning. Because Yeshua is the Aleph Tav, he's the beginning and the end. Mm. So starting with a miracle that points to the end or the goal, and then do the work that leads up to that. Mm. I think that that's the, the plan of the outline mm. of the, what miracle comes first. Mm. So the marriage mm. feast is prophetic of the, the wedding of the groom, mm. which is Yeshua mm. and his bride. <coughs> and the wine has got significance associated with the purification of the red heifer. Because the wine, the miracle of the wine, is um, something that brings joy at a feast. Mm. So it's all about the end goal of a feast, having joy, the joy of salvation, and the joy of the bride celebrating with mm. the groom. Mm. And I think it will be an extremely joyous uh, mm. situation. Mm. And it is because mm. of the purification waters that allow people to become his bride. Mm. That purification cleansing that happen in their lives, in their walk with him. Um, but not only that, the symbolism of mm. the grape. Now, if you think about what does it take to make wine? You need to have fruit, which is a grape. Uh, you need water to actually water the plant to produce the grape. And then you have to squash the fruit mm. to squeeze the juice out of it. And that in itself is the process of purification on a spiritual level when you look at it personally. Mm. So I need the water of the word of Yahweh in order to grow, to bear fruit. I need to go through difficult situations so he can squeeze me yeah. to bring the wine. And as a result of that, mm. there will be joy. Mm. So that's the, the link to the wine, mm. the bride, the marriage feast, the joy, and the process of purification mm. that need to happen. Mm. So the purification cannot happen outside of mm. interacting with the word. Mm. So the red yeah. heifer sprinkling doesn't mean a thing unless you access the water of Yahweh first. That's part of it because through that only then you can produce the grapes or the fruit. And there's three verses that basically talk about the squashing of Yahweh's people that produce wine. Jeremiah 48 says, And I have made the wine to cease from the wine presses. No one will tread them with shouting. The shouting will not be shouts of joy. Oh, this one doesn't make sense. I should probably read the beginning. So gladness and joy are taken away from the fruitful feet field, even from the land of Moab. I have made the wine to cease from the wine presses. No one will treat uh, them with shouting. The shouting will not be shouts of joy. So this basically show you that the pressing of the wine was an occasion where the people came together, they mm. Some, mm. Uh, squeezed the grapes, and then they produced the wine, and that produced mm. joy. But he said that will stop. Mm. Um, next one is in Lamentations, which more talk about the wine press. And Yahweh has rejected, uh, sorry, Yahweh has rejected all my strong men in my midst. He has called the appointed time against me to crush my young men. Yahweh has trodden as a wine press the virgin daughter of Judah. Mm. So Yahweh is squeezing and trotting on his own people as a wine press so that the purpose of that is to produce the wine that will lead to joy eventually so that's a bit of consequences of foolishness and then revelation 14 talk about um, put in your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the wine of the earth because of her grapes are ripe so the angel swing his sickle to the earth and gathered the clusters from the wine of the earth and threw them in the great wine press of the wrath of Elohim. Mm. So that talks about the pressing down of the wine. Now if you think about that in context of hell, it talks about judgment, mm. evil people being trodden down and squeezed and they will produce wine that will lead to joy. The previous one talked about Judah being squashed down and trodden down 
in a wine press mm. in order to produce wine in order to produce joy mm. the outcome of the consequences of judgment always leads to joy mm. and what joy the joy of salvation mm. so even the concept of hell or punishment mm. is not eternal mm. it is a wine press process mm. as soon as you're trampled down and mm. all the juice has been squeezed out of you mm. you might go well, it's mm. the fire is the only thing that's eternal and that's God's judgment because you know but where does the eternal fire comes from from, 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 yeah. from his yeah. throne from his throne yeah mm. and that it's has to do with holiness it's, it's purification yeah. it's not for destruction mm. no, it's got it. a purpose that's it yeah. mm. at the end of the day that's it that's what it's for is to yes. get rid of everything that's not of him so that it can that's be reconciled it, it yes. cleans us yeah. from everything he uses fire wine press mm. to cleanse mm. to purify it's all about the purification process mm -hmm. so the restoration of humanity is about purifying humanity mm. whether you agree with him be sprinkled on day three mm. or whether you wait till day seven oh it's too late you're still going to the wine press mm. a thousand years temple mm. and then after that you'll be outside the city mm. like Zechariah 14 says not burning forever and ever and ever and ever mm. and ever. Mm. Yeah, there's yeah, a, there's an end to your pain. Yeah. 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 So the symbolism that Yahweh is using, even in, mm. in the book of Revelation, mm. harmonize with the purpose or the outcome or the goal mm. of his intent and what you want to do. Mm. Now, when you look at the word Yeshua, it means Yahweh is salvation. Mm. Yasa means um, salvation, when you put the Vav in it, it, became, it becomes my salvation. Mm. So Vav is the number six, that means man. Mm. So when you personify him in your life, he becomes your personal savior. Mm. So salvation is um, an outcome of the work of the Messiah. Mm. And it is like he is pointing to Yahweh, mm. is salvation. I am the means to that salvation, but because he's the red heifer, he's also the judge, he's also the one who administers the people to go through the wine press. Mm -hmm. He allows that. Mm -hmm. He's the one who converted water into wine. He's the one who makes the wine. He's mm -hmm. the one who will trot you down to squeeze all the juice out of you so mm -hmm. that eventually you will experience joy mm -hmm. to get rid of all those things. So the trampling down is nothing other than the purification processes mm. that you have to undergo. Mm. And the more severe your DNA has been corrupted, the more trotting down there will be to get rid of it. Mm. But he has a lot of patience and he will work with mm. you in order to remove all the unholiness. So the thing that's squeezed out is all the yucky stuff, I mean, in terms of a person, but then it's the fermenting process yeah. that produces it. It's quite it's amazing, isn't yes. it? Yeah. Well they throw away the pips and the seed you know, the seeds yeah, the, and the Oh, the, so the, 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 the skin. Yeah, when well, you just keep the juice that was right. inside. Yeah. You, you know, you get all the, the juice off and all that. that. Mm. Yeah. yeah. It's the That's same concept so. as the wheat and the chaff. Yeah. yeah. You don't keep the chaff, that no. gets burned. Yeah. I'm not the chaff. Right. On the wheat, but mm. my chaff needs to be removed from right. me. Okay. Yeah. So that will be burned. Yeah. Mm. Okay, the flesh that's. Well, oh, the, yeah, the, the metal, the yeah. gold and silver yeah. that burns, and the other the stuff dross. that's <coughs> mixed in with it comes to the top mm. and gets scooped off and thrown away. Mm. Yeah. Mm. It's interesting, the, um, the, I never thought of the, uh, the prophetic thing of, the, of that miracle in, uh, in the, at the wedding. Yeah, because they, he even says, doesn't he? My time has not come yet, because you think, well, what's that got to do with you? Know? Anything. <laughs> and then, yeah. and then at the end, the the um the owner or host or whatever says, oh, you the you brought the best to last. Most people have it the yes. other way around. Yes. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. And it's a picture of the. Oh, and there's a scripture that says, um, or I think it might be a proverbs. Um, the end of a thing is better than its beginning. Yes, you think? Yeah. I think it's important. Mm. <laughs> yeah. So I often think. I so it think doesn't matter how we mix the paint on your palette, mm. there will be joy at the end when they look at your beautiful picture. Mm. Once it's complete. <laughs> I'd love to be about that thick from all the time. Scraping out <laughs> more oil. <laughs> 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 Yeah. Yeah. I'll start again. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah, mm-hmm. so in my experience, it's it's less painful to work with Yahweh than to work against Him. Mm. So try to make it on day three to get your sprinkle. Yeah. <laughs> Not leave it till day seven, because mm-hmm. otherwise there's a wine press coming. Mm. But at the end of that, there will be joy eventually. Mm. Um, mm. So the stubborn will become unstubborn eventually. Mm. Um, yeah. So what else can day three mean? Do you know? Is there any other... Uh, day three. What was created on day three? Uh, let it be light and then separated the waters from the waters. It's the separation of the water and the land. That's day three. Mm. And it's the foundation of mm. growth. Because without soil you can't plant seed. Mm. So day three represents a pure heart mm. where you can sow your seed into. So you can start to grow mm. and spring That's forth. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and you rose on day three. Mm. It's new life. It's new sprouts. Yeah, right. yeah. New beginning. Mm. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> and That's and crazy. and on day three there was separation, and separation is normally painful mm. because you want to cling on to your old little life mm. and your old habits and all <laughs> that. But you want to separate that, and once it's separated, mm. then you can start selling your seed, mm. new life, little grapes. <laughs> the other thing about the grapevine is if you don't give a grapevine structure to grow up against mm. and it grows on the ground it doesn't bear fruit yes. that's why the Torah is the structure you need to uplift mm. to the structure same as mm. Moses' arms in order to bear the fruit mm. I think it was Mark B that actually gave a teaching on how to raise children and she was saying that um, she was using the energy of the uh, grapevine. Mm. And she said if you don't do structure, do the grapevine, it just grows all over the ground and it doesn't do the top and do the fruit. Mm. She said the same to your children. If you don't give them structure to run, mm. they will go into the world. Mm. Yeah. Mm. They won't produce good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it's true. Mm. So it's necessary to prune the mm-hmm. 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 yeah. mm-hmm. mm-hmm. yeah. Correction. Mm-hmm. Time to the <laughs> Spent years in, in uh, Christian schools where they, instead of providing the solid meat of the word, yes, please. you know, and it's just log- uh, line by line, precept upon precept, it was all, you know, quick, um, what do you call it? entertainment m- more entertaining ways to present spiritual concepts mm. rather than them having to invest mm. something in, uh, themselves, in, a, yeah. in themselves so if you do that i mean mm. you know you show them a cartoon mm. the cartoon's gone there's nothing left it's just mm. you, know, you wait for the next entertainment oh, session years and years mm. and years and no one listens no one listens mm. <laughs> <laughs> Hmm? It's true, isn't it? So, yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Anyway, we probably should be going. Yeah. It's three. So I'll just close in prayer, and then we can yeah. depart. Depart. Yes. depart. Not too long. <laughs> no. All right, Harry, can you do us the honors? Mm-hmm. Lord, I've been stuffed full with physical food <laughs> and with spiritual food to the point where uh, we're just feeling very very satisfied lord that um, there is so much depth to your word that we're incapable of comprehending it um, in its full we thank you for your gift uh, for philip's gift that you've uh, you've brought to us and uh, and also letty's input as well that um, it's been something that's been a great blessing to us and uh, father we just thank you that what we've uh, received today will not just uh, wither away but will be become uh, Lord part of the the anchor point for future understanding of your word as we continue on our journey with you mm. thank you mm. amen, amen.